This is very much the, the theme for today, the first uh, Sunday in Advent. I came across this p- little piece of article about this famous preacher in central London, church called Westminster Chapel uh, near Victor- Victoria. And uh, his name is Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's, he's a Welsh preacher. Uh, and, uh, and originally he was a medical student in St. Bath uh, Hospital in London. And uh, he became a medical doctor. Uh, but then he sensed God's call upon uh, his life. He joined the church in uh, Victoria. Uh, and just the day before, he was officially accepted into the church position. Uh, Second World War broke out. And obviously during the war time, he saw a lot of tragedies. You know, so many lives lost. And he, in the end, lost any hope in the world. The world looks like completely hopeless, dark place. And if you go through, you know, I haven't, any, any, I haven't had any personal experience of going through wartime, but if you were in a, that kind of situation, you know, you, you, will, you, will, you will understand what I mean. It's completely hopeless, dark uh, situation. The humanity, what the humanity uh, can do sometimes, the evil stuff, the terrible stuff, what humanity uh, can do. So he became more and more convinced there's nothing else in the world that brings real hope apart from Jesus, the Son of God, the Gospel, the Word of God. So he gave up his medical profession and decided to be a full-time preacher. So he joined the church uh, and he worked there for 30 years, generations, and, uh, and, 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 and tirelessly preaching the Gospel. So that, that piece of uh, article was uh, titled, The Only Hope in the Hopeless World. The Only Hope in the Hopeless World. Now today is the first Sunday in Advent. Advent, as you know, uh, Greek uh, Adventus, which means coming or arrival. So traditionally, this is a day when Christians, uh, you know, during, during the Middle Ages, they started uh, preparing and waiting for the first coming of Christ, but also at the same time, the second coming of Christ as well. And they had, a, for the next four Sundays, they had a different theme for each Sunday. Uh, hope, peace, joy, and love. So the first Sunday today was always about hope. And so, you know, we want to think about this theme of hope this morning. When you become a Christian, uh, there's something happens in your heart, and that is you carry the sense of hope, no matter what. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situations, you carry the hope. When you accept Jesus into your life, you carry the hope. And that's what you see in the Bible. Men and women, Christian people, they always carried hope. In the absolutely hopeless situation, you can be absolutely hopeful because of Jesus. And you know, the very first verse that was spoken on the day of Pentecost, On the day of Pentecost, you know, Peter preached the very first scripture. He quoted from Joel chapter 2. And he said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will receive visions. And your old men will dream dreams. So when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you become a Christian and filled with the Holy Spirit, the one thing you can notice is you, you, you have this, you carry these dreams. You carry these visions, the children, and even the old people, they see visions, they dream, they talk about the future, prophesy. And that's what happens when we become uh, Christians. So hope is very much our language. Now, when you look at the Bible, the Old Testament, you see time and again, uh, people failed. After this fantastic creation, God created the world. But time and again, in every generation, in every age, people failed. Shortly after the amazing creation, this is Genesis chapter 6, it says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. This is not far from creation time. And so God had no choice but to wipe out every life. And that's Noah, Noah's flood. And then, and then there was you know, a bit of restoration, Noah, the three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But then they became proud again, and they start building this Tower of Babel. And God had to confuse the language and scatter everyone uh, you know, uh, away. 
And then through Abraham, uh, and God started something new. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they had uh, 70 people. They moved to Egypt. But in Egypt, they had a terrible time. They experienced sins and, you know, uh, 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 sufferings. And so God sent them out uh, through Moses. So they were in the wilderness and they had, uh, you know, they had just maybe two weeks to cross the wilderness and get to the promised land. But they ended up spending 40 years, 40 years, constant grumbling, complaining, sinning, disobeying. And so finally they arrived in the, in the promised land, the land of Canaan, and they're supposed to influence the local, you know, uh, evil cultures, but instead they were corrupted by those cultures and they became part of it. And so you see the cycle of judges sin repentance sin repentance it continues and they cry out god we want we want king so god allowed king and the soul of david you know solomon but then in the end the the northern kingdom of israel and the southern kingdom of Jews, they all destroyed they all destroyed it looked like the kingdoms of god in the earth on the earth came to an end and then after 70 years in babylon they came back to jerusalem and they restarted the building the kingdom this temple but then again, it was people were corrupt. So when you see, that's the end of the Old Testament. And when you see the Old Testament, uh, you see time and again, people failed. Uh, you know, they, they, they disobeyed. They went away from God. However, there is a continuing thread of hope throughout the Old Testament. And that is God had this dream. God didn't, didn't, didn't lose his hope. God had this hope and his dream to bring salvation and to bring a savior, savior, a messiah into the world and to bring everyone uh, to join his kingdom. And so today we see this uh, passage in Luke chapter 3. This is really genealogy, uh, part of genealogy of Jesus. And, uh, you know, when I used to read this, uh, you know, genealogy in the Bible, I used to skip over that because I thought this is boring, this is meaningless, you know, full of unfamiliar names. I thought, you know, nothing to do with me. But then I learned this is actually a very important part of the scripture. This is a Bible's way of really condensing a long history into a short summary. Okay. So in this chapter, Luke chapter 3, we, we only read half of it, but in this genealogy, you can see the entire history of Old Testament. They are all condensed in this together. So this is very important. And I, as I looked at this, uh, this passage, I realized there was also messages of hope, prophecies about Jesus uh, uh, summarized in this, in this genealogy. Now it begins in verse 23, it says, Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Uh, he was a son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli. That's how it begins. And then at the end, verse 38, it says, The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, and the son of God. That's how it ends. So it begins with God and Adam and all the way to Joseph. So it, it contains the every, you know, all the history of the old Testament. And I want to focus on three names here this morning. Verse 31, it says the son of David. Verse 33, the son of Judah. Verse 34, the son of Abraham. And verse 38, the son of Adam. How Jesus is the hope of the nation. Let's look at this, uh, this, this name one by one and see uh, how that is possible. The first thing is this, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm uh, looking at this in, in reverse order. So let's look at Jesus being the son of Adam, verse 38. Uh, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, and the son of God. So here we see Jesus was the son of Adam, meaning he came as a perfect man. Okay, he wasn't like a half God and half human, you know, mysterious, uh, you know, nature. No. He was a perfect man and perfect God. He was the son of Adam. Now, it was important that Jesus came as a humanity, as the son of Adam. Now, you know, people, when, when people think about Christmas and the prophecies about Messiah and Christ, they think, uh, they think about, oh, Jesus was you know, going to be born in Bethlehem. And, and, uh, and we think about Isaiah's prophecy. But actually, the prophecy about Jesus uh, starts very early on in the book of Genesis. In the first chapters of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, this is when shortly after Adam and Eve committed the sins, 
and God sends these messages of punishment to Adam. He's going to work all, you know, all, all throughout his lifetime. And, and uh, Eve, she, she's going to have pain and she's going to have children. But then to serpent, uh, this is what God said. I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay. So he talks about this offspring of woman, offspring of woman, which is quite strange because in the Bible, when you think about offspring, descendant, genealogy, it is, it is always male. Okay. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Never with women. But here it talks about the offering, it talks about the offering of the woman, meaning uh, this offering, of course, is Jesus. Uh, Jesus was born as a man, but he didn't carry the sin of Adam, virgin birth. So this is a hint of virgin birth. He came as a man, but he didn't inherit the sin, the sin of Adam, the original sin of Adam. So he was a sinless man. He came as a man, but he was a sinless man. He was a perfect man. So he could be a substitute for us. And then God says, uh, this offspring, he will crush the head of the serpent. Okay, And that summarizes really well what Jesus was going to, going to do when he came. Okay, He will destroy the work of the devil. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, he who does what is sinful is of the devil. But because the devil, uh, because the devil uh, has been sinning from the beginning, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So uh, what Jesus was going to do was prophesied here very early on in Genesis chapter 3. And of course, the greatest thing the devil can do is you know, through sin and death. That's the greatest challenge that we face. And what Jesus did was he came and he destroyed the death, the power of sin and the power of death by dying on the cross, but rising again from the dead, destroying the work of the devil. Okay. People are always afraid of death. They're always afraid of death and they have no answer what happens after we die. Okay. But we have a very clear answer. Uh, Jesus destroyed the power of death and, uh, and he rose again from the dead. I remember one lady sharing this testimony that her father was in hospital very sick and uh, and very serious condition and and the father one day saw some kind of you know angels of death you know in dark uh, uh, robes and and the one and and the second one and the third one they they enter uh, the world the world uh, uh, in the hospital Okay, and he was terrified because it looks like you know the, the death angels entered the, the room and then just waiting, just waiting for, for him to die and take him to you know somewhere else. So he was really terrified uh, in his vision and he really prayed, began to pray, God, please help me, you know, help me. And, and so, uh, and then the, the death angels realized and they left. Okay, so some, you know, sometimes when we face such situations, death is, is frightening. Uh, it is the greatest enemy for the humanity. But Jesus, he came and he defeated the death and he gives us the gift of eternal life. Uh, and then in the same chapter later on, uh, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So God kills an animal and, uh, and skin, uh, skin the animal and makes this garment uh, clothes and clothe Adam and his wife, symbolizing, symbolizing that Jesus was going to die. He was he was going to be sacrificed, and he was going to he was uh, going to give us new life. Interestingly, in the New Testament, very often believing in Jesus is explained in terms of new clothes. Okay, putting on new clothes. Uh, it says Romans thirteen. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Galatians chapter 3, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So we clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ. We have a new clothes, okay? You know, when you have clothes, uh, um, you know, even though it is a new, fantastic, brand new one, when you, when you, when you wear them for, for a few days, it, it gets dirty and you need to wash them. You need a new one, okay? Uh, so when we live our lives, we get we picked up in sins and dirt. So we need new clothes. And the, the new clothes that God has given us is the clothes of Jesus Christ, washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And we have the clothes of Christ. 
uh, in the revelations in the last days uh, there's a vision that from every nation every tribe every language and every people people standing and in palm branches in their hands and they are worshiping God and they wear white robes the Bible says they wear they're wearing white robes and the white robes it was washed in the blood of the lamb okay washed and cleansed in the blood of the lamb wearing white robes and 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 praising God in heaven so that's the great hope for the nation that's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ we are all sinners we are all sinners but by the death of Jesus by the blood of Jesus we are washed away we are we are cleansed and we have we have been clothed with the cloth of Jesus so this morning as we as we have the communion this is a constant reminder uh, that we come before God and that we are covered by the blood of Jesus once again and so hopefully this morning as we join the communion that we will have the same uh, wonderful experience of cleansing uh, in the communion uh, today now secondly we think about Abraham uh, verse 34 <laughs> The son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Jesus being uh, the son of Abraham. Now, what does that mean? So Jesus, the son of Abraham, what, what, what does that mean? Well, there are two things that are very important. Uh, when, when Paul explains the gospel, the essence of the gospel in the book of uh, uh, Romans, he uses the, the, the example of Abraham. He says, Romans chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 3, he says, What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous righteousness. When, when, now when a man works, his wages are not regarded credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trust God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as, as righteousness. So Abraham is an example. He believed in God and he was called righteousness. He was credited as uh, righteousness okay so we as Christians that's what we do we believe in Jesus and we become righteous we are justified just like Abraham uh, was declared as righteous by believing in God now this is a key truth in Christianity but this is something that people find it really hard to understand people find it really hard to accept sometimes historically it was the case because you know during the Reformation uh, this was the truth that they preached but people died. People died. They didn't. They didn't accept it. They didn't agree. Okay. And even today, some, sometimes you know, I hear people that they, they find it really kind of confusing and difficult to understand. They say, "So you just you, you saved by believing in Jesus, uh, not through good works? How does that work?" Because many other religions, they they teach otherwise. You got to be good. You know, good people. You do good work. Okay. Uh, but in Christianity, the truth is quite uh, different. It says we are saved only by believing in Jesus. Now, let me explain that very quickly, uh, you know, a little step by step. The first thing is this. We are all sinners before God. We were, we are all sinners before God. Number two, we cannot save ourselves by our own good works. Because even how, however good you are, you are still a sinner. So we cannot save ourselves by our good works. Uh, that's why we need a someone who is perfect and sinless who can save us. Because we cannot save ourselves. We need somebody else. We need a someone who is a perfect and sinless who can save us. And Jesus is the Savior who died for us and rose again from the dead. And he proved that he was a sinless by rising again from the dead. So I need to, we need to put our faith in Jesus and accept what he did for us, what he did for me. So that's faith. We put our faith in Jesus. And because of what Jesus did uh, for me, uh, when I accept it, when I accept what he did, uh, according to my faith, God justifies me, calls me righteous rather than guilty. Okay, Because of my faith in Jesus, what he did, God justifies me. God declares, uh, I, you know, I, I'm righteous. I'm not a sinner anymore. Uh, so that's the that's the, so. Uh, th therefore, my spiritual position now is not a sinner anymore. It is holy one, righteous or saint in the Bible. And so many people don't understand this, and they still carry this guilt, you know, guilt, 
and, and you know, sense of condemnation. Okay, thinking, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm a terrible sinner, I'm a terrible sinner. Well, we will. But because of what Jesus did when we accepted our spiritual position has changed once and for all. Not a sinner anymore, our spiritual position. But our condition may still be sinful. Our condition may still be, you know, making mistakes. Okay, but our position, which is very different, our position is not a sinner. And uh, we are holy one, we are righteous. And that's what the Bible says. We are justified by God's grace. He calls us righteous. Uh, we are not guilty anymore. There's nothing, there's no more condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And for those of you who did the Freedom in Christ course, this is the key teaching. This is the key teaching, and this is the first teaching we learned in the Freedom in Christ course. Okay, as a result of my salvation, not as a condition for my salvation, as a result of my salvation, I now need to try to live a good life. Okay, so this is as a, as a result, not, not as a condition, as a result. Now we need to try to live a good life as a disciple of Jesus and a child of God. But our good works doesn't save us. Our good works don't save us. Okay, so that's really, uh, in a very simple way, uh, the essence of the gospel. We, we are saved by faith in Jesus. Just like a Abraham was called righteous by his faith in God. And then there's another thing that Jesus being the son of Abraham means Abraham, uh, when God called him, uh, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to many others. That was the identity of Abraham. Okay. So when we say Jesus is the son of Abraham, it also means when we, when we become Christian, it also means the blessings of God cannot just remain in ourselves. There's no private Christianity. The blessing of God should not stay in myself. It should always flow. Okay, Abraham, I will bless you and then you will be a blessing to many others. And all, all peoples on earth, in fact, God said, will be blessed through you. Everyone, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And God even changed Abraham's name. His name was Abraham, which was, uh, which means uh, exalted father, but Abraham meaning father of many nations. Okay. So his, his, his identity was always, okay, God blessed me. God gave me this blessing so that I can be a blessing to many others. I'm like a social blessing, so I need to uh, overflow. I need to uh, send this blessing out. I need to, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, bless others. Okay. There's constant overflow of blessing. Uh, it could be financially, it could be spiritually, it could be, you know, uh, physically, in every, in every way. The blessing of God should flow through us. And so when, when angel appeared and announced this news about Jesus, uh, they said, the angel said to, to the shepherd, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Okay. Never, never, never just for yourself. For all the people, when you receive the gospel, when you believe in Jesus, your next step is how can I carry this gospel to somebody else? How can I bring this blessing to somebody else? In my family, in my workplace, in my, in my neighborhood, in my community. That's our identity. That's our job. We, we are never, we are never a, a container of blessing. We are channel of blessing. We channel through God's blessing. And uh, uh, so, so, so that's what, what it means, uh, Jesus, the son of Abraham. And, uh, you know, it's great that we have this Christmas celebration. Uh, and in the main hall, they had a, they had a, they had a different evangelistic events for the, uh, uh, you know, obviously for the, for the Korean church and Korean uh, community. And we have this Christmas uh, celebration. And uh, we want to use this opportunity, fantastic uh, opportunity, Christmas season. And people are most likely try to come to church and, 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 and you know, join the uh, celebration. So it is an amazing opportunity that we can, uh, we can really maximize and invite people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you invite people, as you pray for your friends and family members, non-Christian friends and family members, you are fulfilling your call. You are sending away your blessing to others. You are not just containing it to yourselves. Okay, you are, you are releasing it, you are overflowing it, and you are sending it to other people. And hopefully, in God's way and in God's time, they will also come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. So let's continue you know, over the next couple of weeks. Let's continue to pray. Let's continue to you know, hand out the flyers and invite people. Okay, and until the last day, until the day before, and that's what I usually do, until the day before. 
And you're surprised sometimes that people turn up. They still turn up. And they, they hear and they enjoy, uh, uh, they enjoy uh, the service and, and the fellowship and the food. Okay? Jesus is the hope of the nation. Amen? Jesus is the hope of the United Kingdom. Jesus is the hope of Europe. Jesus is the hope of all the nations. I, um, I had a very interesting text message yesterday. And this is a, this is a very small Korean church in Belfast. Okay? I never knew that there was a church in Belfast. Belfast, Northern Ireland. Okay, but I I had this text message yesterday, and uh, so this is this little little church, just about fifteen people, including children, very small, just a few families. Okay, and they have a, they have a pastor, but uh, he's just studying there, but he's moving on, he's going to move on soon. So they were they, they were like praying for a new pastor uh, from next next year. Okay, so 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 they you know, they try to find they try to find you know some some ways to 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 sort this uh, you know issue and try to ask people to pray. So I was really touched by that. You know, I haven't got an answer. I you know, you know it's, it's not easy to 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 send somebody to to Belfast, to Northern Ireland, but I was really touched by that. And you know they they have, they have a, just a, a maybe 40, 50 uh, people there. But they, they, they started meeting together and, you know, weekly, uh, about 15 people worshiping God, listening to the uh, word of God and, and, and serving Jesus and fellowshipping together. Fantastic. I was wondering, what, what are they doing? What, you know, what are they doing up there in Belfast? Okay. But wherever, wherever they are, they're worshiping Jesus and they meet together because they know Jesus is the hope. Jesus is the only hope wherever you are. Wherever in the world you go, Jesus is uh, the hope. And then thirdly, we, we look at this verse uh, 33. It says, Jesus, uh, the son of Aminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, and the son of Judah. Now, this is a bit more tricky. Okay. Now, Jesus being the son of David, we know that. Jesus being the son of Abraham, we know that. But Jesus being the son of Judah, the son of Perez and the son of Judah, that's slightly tricky. Because when you think about the story of Judah, originally his beginning was very shameful. Okay? So to call Jesus, Jesus you know, the son of Judah wasn't really a nice thing. Uh, now in this genealogy in Luke, doesn't really mention that, but when you look at another genealogy, which is in Matthew chapter 1, it says, uh, verse 3, it says, Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. So Judah had two sons, Perez and Zerah, through Tamar. And Tamar, who, who was Tamar? Well, Tamar was uh, his daughter-in-law, according to chapter 38 of Genesis. Uh, book of Genesis. Okay. So Tamar, one day, disguised herself as a prostitute. And Judah was on his way to a sacrifice, and he saw this woman thinking that she, she's a prostitute, and they had a, they had a relationship. And so babies were born, children were born, Perez and Zerah. So when you think about it, this is really, you know, this is not a nice, nice story. You know, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a people of God, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. Okay. And, and not only that, uh, Judah was a fourth son of Jacob's 12 children. You know, they, Jacob had 12 children, and Judah was number four. Now, if you are number four in those days, you have no standing. You have no authority. It's only the top, you know, top son, the, the first one, okay? The first or second. But if you are in number four, you have no chance. Not only that, Judah was also son of Leah, not Rachel. No, Jacob had uh, four wives, Leah, Rachel, and two servant girls. And, uh, and, and Rachel was always his favorite, okay? Rachel had uh, Benjamin and Joseph. And, and Jacob always loved uh, 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 Joseph. Okay. But Judah was son of Leah, unloved wife. And, and so, you know, so, so again, he has, he has a very little chance, very little standing. And he also married a, a Canaanite woman, a pagan woman, which was forbidden by God. Okay, again, which was quite shame, shameful. So all in all, when you think about Judah, his beginning was really shameful. He wasn't, there was nothing, nothing to, to boast about, nothing to, to, to be proud about. But later... God changed all of that. All change. All change in God's providence. So when it comes to the last chapter, the last section of Genesis, this is what Jacob says when he, when he was about to die. And he blesses, he blesses his children and he gives these rather prophetic messages uh, to children. And he says to Judah, when he came to Judah, he says, Judah, 
your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. You know, the neck enemies, your hand, meaning that you'll be powerful. You are winning, you're overcoming. Okay? So your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey. My son, like a lion, he crouches and, and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Suggesting when the Messiah comes, he will come from Judah, the tribe of Judah. Okay, And indeed, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which was the land of Judah. And, uh, and he came from the tribe of Judah. And later we know Judah became the main, the, main, the, the leading tribe. Okay, During the wilderness time, it was always the Judah which was moving on the first. It was always located toward the, the front of the tabernacle, the sunrise, which, you know, which symbolized the importance. And from Judah, King David came. And from Judah, Jesus came. Jerusalem, the capital, is in Judah. Okay. So beginning, in the beginning, it was very shame, shameful. Nothing to uh, be proud about. But God changed everything. Okay. So Judah became the powerful name, glorious name, wonderful name. So when we say Jesus being the son of Judah means God can change you, okay, your life and my life. Uh, even though your, your beginning may be small or maybe rather rather shameful, okay, nothing, nothing, nothing to be proud about, but God can change all that. You know, I remember the story, uh, you know, we, we, a few years ago we watched the, the cross DVD one Easter time, uh, you know, the uh, created by Billy Graham. And in that cross DVD, there's a story of this singer, a lady, young lady, called Lacey. Okay, she was brought up uh, by a single mom. Maybe, maybe mom and dad got divorced, and so you know, raised up by a single mom. And she was always had this difficult upbringing, and and uh, you know, it was really hard. Uh, and so, so very often in the night time, in in her bed, she was crying, weeping and crying, and and thinking quite often, I don't want to rise rise up next morning. I, I don't want to wake up next morning. I let, let, you know, let this life just end here. So she had, she had this constant suicidal thought and uh, you know, often she, I mean, when I come back from school, I'm going to, I, I just going to end my life. And grandma uh, noticed, what's wrong with you? you know, what, 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 what do you think, what's wrong? Okay. And grandma almost you know, by, by force uh, brought her to church and she, didn't, she had no interest, no, no interest whatsoever in going to church. But um, grandma really uh, pushed her. So she came along, she came to church and sat at the back of the seat, no interest at all. But then the preacher started talking about the love of God, the love of the Father. Okay. And she, she was, she was, she was, she was, uh, you know, she was touched by, by that. And then the preachers talked about, well, there is a sense of uh, a spirit of suicide here, spirit of suicide in this room. And she was shocked. Because that was, that was what she was contemplating. After this church, I'm going to kill myself. Okay. But all of a sudden, this preacher is saying, there's a spirit of suicide here. Okay. But I want to tell you, whoever that is, that it is, I want to tell you that God loves you. God loves you. And she was really shocked. Okay. And, and, and you know, I'm here for the first time, but no one knows me. But then all of a sudden, from the pulpit, this preacher is talking about me. And so she, she was shaken and she was leaving the building. And then the man at the gate, uh, you know, and says, uh, uh, telling her, well, you know, young lady, I want to tell you, God wants you to know that he loves you. He sees all your tears at night, he said at the gate. And she was shocked again. Wow, this, what's going on here? Okay. And obviously God saw everything. God saw what was going on in her heart. God saw what she was doing during the night. Okay. And so... You know, shortly later, she came to she came to believe in Jesus, and her life was completely changed. And now, singing gospel singer, singing songs and giving testimonies, and touching so many people's lives. So earlier, rather shameful, dark, miserable, but now completely changed, bringing hope, uh, encouragement to many people. Jesus is the son of Judah, and he is still the son of Judah today. Amen. So we may have some difficult past, but our past doesn't determine our future. Okay, it is Jesus. When we have Jesus in our lives, He is the hope. Uh, he's the hope of our nation. And then just finally, we see Jesus, the son of David, verse 31. Son of Melia, son of Mena, son of Matata, son of Nathan, and the son of 
David. Jesus, the son of David. This is a, this is a often uh, you know the phrase that we hear in the Gospels. You know the the, the blind man they they, they call Mer have mercy on us, son of David. Okay. So and, and then when Jesus entered the Jerusalem for the last time, and they sh they shout Hosanna to the son of David. Okay. So they always shouted, son of David, Jesus, son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, son of son of David. What does that mean? When they shouted, son of David. Well, Isaiah chapter nine. Uh, in a well-known uh, prophecy, it says, To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Do you know what that means? Government will be on his shoulders. That means to this child, there will be power, there will be government, there will be authority. Okay, so Jesus being the son of David, just like David was the king, he was a reigning king, he was the most powerful king. Okay, as Jesus is reigning in our lives. It's not like a little Jesus, you know, somewhere. We are worshiping the King Jesus, the powerful Jesus, the majestic Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. You know, Christians, sometimes we feel that we are marginalized. Church is meeting somewhere in the corner. That doesn't make any, any difference, any influence. No, we're worshiping big Jesus. Okay, Jesus is a son of the David. And when the Magi, they came to Jerusalem and they were looking for a king of the Jews. Where is the king of the Jews? Herod was terrified. They were looking for king of Jews. And when Jesus died on the cross, there was a, you know, there was a, there was a little sign on the cross which says the king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. Okay. He is not only the king of the Jews, he is the king of all nations. Philippians chapter 2, it says, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. So this is a Jesus that we are worshiping. Okay. We have, we have this, 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 this King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know, sometimes when you have that authority, when you have that power, Often that causes problem. People, when they have nothing, they are humble. But when they have position, when they have title, when they have money, things begin to change. Okay, I was in conference a few weeks ago, and the speakers, several of them, they, they said, uh, 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 talking about church planting, and they said, when you plant a church, don't give titles or position too quick uh, uh, to, to people, they said. They, you know, all of them, they said, okay. Don't, don't give titles and position to keep because, because that may change people's attitude. Okay. So we, human beings, we have a problem handling with power and authority, don't we? You know, we aspire for authority, we aspire for power, we aspire for recognition and, and in title and position. But when we get there, sometimes we don't know how to handle them. So, you know, people, people be, become proud, they become proud. Okay. But what about Jesus? He has the authority, power and authority, heaven and earth. Wow, that's a dangerous place to be. How is he going to handle that? Okay. You know, the Lucifer, he was the, he was the uh, top angel worshiping God and he became proud. He couldn't handle it. And so he became Satan. So how is he going to Jesus handle that? The authority and power. Well, David, again, he's a son of David. And it says in uh, Acts chapter 13, uh, in Acts 13, he says, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. One thing about David, he always knew where he came from. He always knew who the real king is. Yes, he was the greatest king the nation has ever known, but he always knew absolutely clear who is the real king. God is the real king. I was a shepherd boy. I was a shepherd boy. I was nothing. Okay, even my father, my brothers, they, they, they didn't regard me uh, very much. But it was God who anointed me, who called me, who established me as a king. So I need to manage my power and authority in the will of God, in the purpose of God. They will always knew that. Okay. So he says, a man after my own heart. David is a man my, after my own heart. So Jesus, yes, he has authority and power, but always his concern was, what does God want? What is God's will? Okay. And the classic example is in Garden of Gethsemane. You know, I don't want to carry the cross. No one likes the cross. I don't want to die, you know, for a bunch of sinners. I don't want to do that. But he prayed, Father, if you are willing, uh, take this cup from me. 
Yet not my will, but yours be done. Father, if you want, I will do it. I don't want to do it. I, I'm not going to enjoy it. It's, it's not my will, but if you want, I will do it. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus, the son of David. Brothers and sisters, that's the, that's, the, that's the Christianity. That's what we are. That's who we are. I was very touched by this, uh, by this lady. And you know, we have great men and women serving in our church in here and the other building. And you know, loving Jesus and loving brothers and sisters. We have fantastic uh, uh, you know, group of people. You know, serving God and serving the church, serving people with joy and gratitude. And uh, I was thinking about this particular lady, and uh, you know, I'm not going to name, uh, but uh, she's a nursery teacher. She's a part of worship team, singing the worship team. She's a cell leader. And, and by the way, she's a mom of two young children, and she has a full-time job. And what she does, she cleans the toilet every week. Every week. Because she loves Jesus, and she loves people. And she loves um, the church. She she wants to serve you. You may not know. You may not know who is cleaning the toilet when you use the toilet. You know. You may not know who's who's doing this. You know, you know, nice and clean, okay. But she's not seeking any recognition. She's not seeking any fame. But she's happy to serve God because he loves him. And he's happy. She's happy to serve people uh, because she loves the church. Not my will, Lord, but yours. Okay. When you go to the Westminster Abbey, and I just want to end my talk with this one, and the Westminster Abbey, you know, I've been there many, many years ago. I remember seeing this uh, stone, memorial stone, uh, somewhere in the Abbey. You know, there were many, many stones like that. And the only, you have this name, David Livingston, the great Scottish missionary explorer. And uh, he was working in Central Africa for many, many years. And now he's old, he's just sick, he has this fever, and the communication was lost. People didn't know where, where he was, somewhere in the jungle in, in Africa, uh, Zambia, in fact, in that time. Okay. And so in, in 1871, uh, uh, Henry Stanley, a man called Henry Stanley, decided to find David Livingston. Where is he? Where is he? And after a year of search, he finally located where he was. The food was gone, the medicine was gone, everything was gone, and he was suffering with fever. And Mr. Sandy said to the Livingston, uh, Mr. Livingston, let's go home. You've been working in Africa for 30 years. You have given everything you could for the locals here. So you well deserve rest. Let's go home. Let me take you home. Okay? You know, family back home, friends, they're waiting for you. And the Livingston, he said, well, no, no, thank you. Uh, everything I've done in Africa for the last 30 years, it wasn't about my commitment. It wasn't about my service. It was all about my privilege. To me, it was privilege. It wasn't my sacrifice. It wasn't my service or commitment, hard work. It was all about privilege. I always felt privileged to be able to come here and to serve people here and to tell the people about Jesus. What a glorious thing to do. I may have lost my health and my, you know, you know, many, many years, you know, friends, and but this is a privilege. Okay. So he refused to return home. And, uh, and a year later, 1873, the 1st of May, Livingston was found dead in his room in the, in the, in the shape of praying by his bed. And obviously he was brought later and laid uh, in rest in Westminster. And brother and sister, serving Jesus is privilege. It is a privilege. Okay, whatever you do, whatever position you are in, it is privilege. And the good news is, the kingdom of David was going to be forever, God said. It wasn't going to be like just a few generations, a few dynasties. It was going to be forever, and of course, the kingdom of Jesus, our King Jesus, is going to reign forever. We can be absolutely certain. Okay? Even if you die, even when you die, we know into eternity there's a heaven. So there's no fear whatsoever <coughs> when we worship Jesus, when we serve Jesus. Jesus is indeed the hope of the nations. Amen. Amen. And fantastic. What a fantastic thing he did. We, we serve Jesus. <laughs> 
and we worship Jesus together. Would you like to all stand together, please? <coughs> I'm going to read a communion passage and we're going to join the communion uh, together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to 